Communitech helps companies start, grow, and succeed. Our members raise 19% more capital, raise more rounds, hold more patents, and have an increased financial velocity. Communitech member companies scale faster than anywhere else in Canada. So if you're not a Communitech member yet, let's fix that. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining today's Ask Me Anything. My name is Christina Wood, and I'll be moderating today's session on Raising Money Mastery, the secret to an impressive pitch deck. This session will be recorded and available on our Ask Me Anything webpage at communitech.ca. We welcome questions throughout today's discussion, so please use the Q&A feature to ask your questions, or you can upvote questions that have already been submitted. We also invite you to stick around after today's presentation to network at your tables. This is a great opportunity to meet and learn from your peers. Please reach out to your Communitech CSM or advisor after today's session for additional resources on raising capital. You'll see here a list of our upcoming Ask Me Anything sessions. You'll also find them in your Week in Tech and during our Startup and Scale Up newsletters. And lastly, I'd like to introduce today's speaker and welcome Bavik Shohan up to the stage. Thank you. Good morning, Bavik. Thank you for being here. And I will uh, turn it over to you to share your slides and get started with today's presentation. All right. Thank you very much, Christina. Um, first of all, thank you to the community group as well for having us back again to hold another workshop. And I'm hoping this is going to be a helpful session for all the members today. So I'm just going to bring up my screen and hopefully you guys can all see that. Uh, you guys can see my screen. Yep, looks great, thank you. Perfect, all right. So, secret to an impressive pitch deck. Uh, so a lot of companies out there uh, trying to raise money uh, all the time, when should always be raising. And a lot of times when I see a lot of decks that come to me, when I'm on panels uh, doing equity investments or just giving advice, uh, I see a lot of uh, decks with a lot of things missing. So this today's session is about key areas and key questions if you have on why it should be there and what should it be there. and and how to be successful and maybe make an impression in where space to make an impression with the pitch deck. So first of all, okay, our financial, what do I do with my company? So we were founded about five years ago. We specialize in non-dilutive financing where it specializes in bridge financing government programs such as tax credits and grants. Um, also we do some asset based lending where we finance co contracts and purchase orders. And we also have an eighth fund uh, that does equity investments. Currently at present, uh, our fund of total assets under management is roughly about 140 million. So we've done pretty well in the last five years in, in doing these sort of services for non-dilutive financing. So what do we solve? Well, our goal is to educate companies and help them sort of raise capital, utilizing non-dilutive funding without giving them equity too early. A lot of companies out there are trying to raise money, end up giving away equity so quick at pre-seed or pre-revenue or real early concept stage, by the time they need you really need to raise money, they no longer own the company. They've given away over 50% because they keep diluting the investment. And next thing you know, they end up working for the company they thought they were gonna own. So our goal is to try and see if we can maximize on other areas where there's funding available. Um, we're a group of entrepreneurs and angel investors uh, that started this company and the management team. And the two early founders um, had a company they'd invested in that was struggling to find a shred financing. So they decided to reach out to a few friends and start this fund and start doing it themselves. What makes me an expert? Um, I've run the largest uh, government funding company, consulting company in Canada for over six years. I've worked for a lot when it comes to some of the largest international brands um, out there as well. And I specialize in business development and marketing. I personally have raised over $30 million in government funding for my own clients and customers that I've worked with. And, and I'm an advisor on many companies, especially early stage companies. They're trying to make a breakthrough. So I ask any entrepreneur, what's the most challenging aspect about launching a startup? The answer is always common across the board. It's always funding and raising capital. So this is why today's session is going to be very handy for everyone that's out there today. So typically sources for raising capital, you know, you have personal investment, friends and family, venture, angel, you have banks, crowdfunding, um, negotiate alternative funding sources, asset back loans. There's a variety of sources, but there's a common theme to all of these is you've got to have a plan uh, and a way to execute on this. And part of your plan is better to showcase your business and the goals and what you're trying to resolve. And that's where the pitch deck comes in very handy. 
So some funding stats before I get into the real deck is, uh, you know, 77% of businesses rely on personal savings when they start going on. Not that much money. Typically, average is probably about less than $5,000 what they start with. Small business requires between about ten dollars and $15,000 of startup capital in order to get it off the ground, whether it's develop a website or buy material or just getting out there, attending events. And a real small percentage of companies actually managed to raise venture capital right at the early stages. It's very, 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 very small amount. So you can see the success rate of the early stage is not that high in getting VC capital. Um, typical companies that start running a seed funding is probably about three years old. Um, so these things, you know, just key stats that are out there currently. And there's not that many companies that reach uh, the unicorn status with a billion dollar valuation. So they're not, they're not a dime a dozen, they're very rare. Um, and most starts will start with two co-founders co rather than one to raise 30% more capital. So if you're a one person show, you're gonna have a harder time raising money. There's two of you, you can spread your wings and probably get more out there, that's out there. So when is a pitch deck useful for a venture? Always. Um, it's like a mini blueprint, a way to sort of keep you focused and you're always gonna be raising money. As your company pivots, as you grow, your plans change, your pitch deck changes. And in the last two years with the pandemic that's happened, a lot of companies, a lot of ideas, a lot of concepts have had to pivot. And so as you're pivoting your ideas and your changes, you've got to put it onto paper. And that's where the pitch deck comes in handy. You know, you're going to get a lot of investors that say, yeah, I love what you're doing. Um, and they still won't write you a check. You go down nine months down the line, they're still interested and they're still asking you the same questions they asked you on day one. So raising capital can be a very long process. So you've got to have alternate ways of getting funding, non-dilutive grants, tax credits, but you're always going to be talking to companies and showing your pitch deck, even if it's for a strategic partner. So you're always going to have to have one. So, you know, how do you convince uh, investors to believe in you, or the banks, or anyone that's bringing money to the table, or partners? Uh, and how do you manage the red flags in your business? These are sort of some questions that a lot of young entrepreneurs or young companies are always looking and asking. And They've got to be specific on milestones they want to achieve. They can't just be an idea in midair and say, hey, I'd love to do this without any real goals or real focus on how they're going to take it from stage to stage and step to step. So less is indeed more in your pitch deck and you only need 13 sections. That doesn't mean 13 slides. It could be anywhere between 15 and 20 slides, but there's 13 key sections. And if you're missing any of these, um, you're not going to be very successful with your pitch deck. So that's what I'm going to cover today is what you need in there some importance in regards to that slide in the section, um, and hopefully you guys can cover that. So the first section is title, nice and simple, nice and easy. It's really important that you have something that is showcasing the name of the company, the brand, it's rememberable or stands out, not just some small font letters and a big picture. It, it really does have to make an impact. First impressions, as they always say, you know, count for a lot. If you've just got a blank white screen with a name on it, it's not going to be very memorable. Um, and sometimes, you know, if there's a certain theme to what you're developing or your, the product or the company itself, you know, you may come back to that. Um, but the last thing is, the first thing is you want to make sure people have a reason to listen to you. So if your title screen or your title page makes an impact and it showcases whether it's a slogan or, or the name of the brand or the company itself, you know, you're going to get ears perked up. So it's a very important title slide. Some people disregard it and think, ah, it's just a title, it just shares my, says my company name. But you, you'd be surprised how much of an impact that initial section actually has when you're presenting. Section two is the problem. And I've seen some decks recently where they don't start with the problem. They start putting a lot of fluff in there, why they exist as a group and how the idea came up. Get straight to the point. What are you solving? The focus has to be on the pain that you're tackling and keep it very simple. Don't complicate it. And, and I always give this advice to everyone is keep it simple, stupid. Sometimes the, the person with the most money in the room is not always the smartest. So if that person gets it, everyone in the room will get what the pain is that you're trying to solve. The number one responsibility is your business is has to be there to solve problems. If you're doing what someone else is doing and it already exists, it's not going to be that interesting, but if you found a pain that really is, is making an impact on the industry and you've got a solution for it, people are going to listen to you. And that's why you're going to showcase why this problem has to have a solution 
and that's what this section is for. Typically, this section is normally one page or one slide, but I, sometimes two slides are needed, especially if it's more of a complex problem. And then it's the solution to the problem. So this is the moment to describe what you've developed and what you created that's going to solve this problem. It does not have to be completely technical. As I said, you've got to get it simple, keep it in layman's terms, what you're solving and what your solution is so everyone understands it. Use simple terms, don't use industry buzzwords. If you're in the gaming industry and you're using all gaming and algorithms and, and codes and things like that, not everyone's gonna get that. You know, If you're in the health industry, be very careful what medical terms you're using. Keep it simple so everyone in the audience can understand exactly what your solution is to the problem you describe in section two. The solution slides, you typically average, I normally see is two slides on that, um, which really gives you enough time and room to discuss and that. And don't write everything on the slides. You know, keep it in bullet point form so you can actually talk about it. You want to give them enough that they were interested, but not enough that they're just reading your slides and not listening to you present. At the end of the day, investors are interested in the speakers, typically the founder or one of the lead leading management team members, and they want to hear from you. They want to hear, they want to be listening to you. So don't put everything on the slide, but enough that it describes or highlights exactly what you're speaking about, just in case they miss something. And then again, as I said, section four could still be part of the solution. This is where the second slides typically come in. You know, you can showcase patents, copyrights, trademarks, anything that you've applied for in this section um, should be listed. You know, timeline for new bringing new products in you know, or what your current solution is. Is it a band-aid fix or what's out there and how you're competitive to that? So your solution has to be highlighted and take that time because that's the real market piece of what you're trying to get everyone interested. It's your solution is what you're developing. Um, the problem's out there, they get that, but the solution is your key focus. And then the market. Now, this is really important on understanding on do you really understand the market you're trying to get into? So you've got to take time to understand. So before you even develop a pitch deck, you should be going out there doing market research, understanding the demographic. Are you in the right country? Are you in the, in the right region to be doing what you're trying to launch, you know, uh, and where you're going to be targeting, right? How you can deploy the solution. So everything you have in the marketing side, you've got to really do some research and showcase you understand what's out there and how it's going to work. If you don't really understand that, you're not going to be able to deploy into the right space that you're in. So you've got to show through your research that there is a need for your solution to the problem. So you've asked the right questions to the right market. So you've got to build out the concept and make sure people are understanding what you're trying to do. So as you're doing market deployment, you know, you've got to have a go to, go -to market plan. It can't just be, oh, we're going to be on Facebook and social media to bring in clients, you know? You've got to be able to understand what's the plan to reach the key audience. Is it door to door? Is it sales going through, you know, old school cold calling, you know? Or is there a different way of doing it? Are you working through agencies, distributors, or you're partnering up with someone that's already in the market and you're piggybacking on their client, not client clientele, and you're working with them. So you've got to have a plan on how you're actually going to get to that client. The worst thing, I see on decks, I don't want to say the worst thing, but what really annoys me as a potential investor or one of these panels is everyone has a billion dollar market. I get that. Every industry is a billion dollar market. But what you really want to showcase is what can you actually achieve in the next 12 to 36 months in the market that you're trying to target? You know, what's the percentage that's realistic that you can actually make an impact in? You've got to show cost that. You know, and costs and known to the mediums of the market are key areas to success. So, as I said, it can't just be Facebook and SEOs. There's got to be more to your market deployment plan and how you're using the resources. Because as you're asking for capital, a lot of your money, and I find a lot of money is as you're at the commercial commercialization stage, it's for marketing. So if you can't highlight exactly where the money is going to be deployed, you're not going to raise any capital. So understanding the demographic and then the go-to market strategy. And then competition is really key. Now, a lot of people are developing and say, well, we're the first of our kind, we're very unique, but it's gotta be something similar out there or a company that's doing something. So you've gotta be able to highlight, okay, what are similar companies doing? And that's why you're different because you're not doing, or you're doing exactly the same, but you're better because you have some other additional features or benefits to what you're developing. 
what are the advantages, you know, and this will also help you find price points, like what are the competition charging and why they're charging that. And it's really important you go through this exercise because if you can't highlight competition and price point and you just say, we're going to charge $200 a month for a monthly subscription for our new app. How did you come up with that? Did you actually go through a real financial financial exercise and is it feasible? And if your competitor is charging a thousand bucks a month, why is there such a big difference, right? So you've got to make sure you understand your competition, the advantages, the disadvantages and showcase, you know that. And again, it doesn't have to be too much detail on a paper. It could just be like a little SWOT analysis showcasing that on a little deck. And then the financials. So financials are very important on two sides of this. One is for you to understand that, is this really gonna be successful? I would, the, another piece of advice I'll give to a lot of young, young entrepreneurs coming through is if this is a passion project and you're doing it because of the, the love of the game or love of the industry, you're not gonna make any money. It's gotta be a business decision. And the financials are probably key to your success, not just for your pitch deck, but for your business plan to raise capital, you've got to understand what's it going to cost you and over how long are you going to have to spend and grow as you grow and are you going to hire more? Um, are you going to have more marketing costs or other additional spend? And when do you start actually breaking even and making money? That's what investors care about is if they give you funding, is it going to take five years for them to get their money back, one year or 20 years? And also for yourself as a CEO or a founder, as you're doing this, you don't want to be doing research and development for 10 years and not make a dime because um, you can't survive that way. So going through the financials and understanding, and I'd say minimum of a three-year forecast plan is good enough, but if you can get to five, even better. Uh, so it shows how you're going to grow your company and what the burn rate's going to be and what it's going to take for you to survive and really helps you determine how much money you really need to raise. And it also helps with valuations as well. So this is probably one of the second most important sections in your pitch deck, understanding what it's all going to cost you to get there. And then you've got your team. Showcase who is your team. Talent is what's going to take this further. If there's no experience and it's just an idea and you're working through your bedroom or your basement putting this together, you know, it's not interesting. But if you've got a team that technical minded experience have come from some great companies or they're just qualified experience, it's going to attract money. So you've got to really showcase your team. You know, a consistent contact is critical. You, know, you can't just be, you know, contact is critical where it's just going to be all over the place. You've got to be able to say, hey, look, we've gone transition, we've gone through this, and we've got the best mentors in the team. So getting financial advisors or business advisors or consultants or legal advice as advisors on your, on your group is also really important. And that's important because... As an investor, if I recognize some of the mentors that you're working with or an advisor, I'm most likely going to invest because say, this person knows what they're doing. They've got history and utilize their time and expertise. So if you can showcase you've got a great team and then you've got great advisors on your team, you're probably going to attract a lot more money a lot quicker when you're doing that. And you have to showcase the talent and experience. If you're coming in with no experience, you've got to give them a reason why you're the best person to speak on speak on this company and why you're the best person they're going to invest in. So highlighting the team is very, very important. And then it's the deal. Okay. So what are you asking for? Uh, how much quick equity are you willing to give up for the ask? The valuation. Whenever you're valuing your company, I always advise go and speak to someone that knows what they're doing. A lot of people, a lot of companies are out for lunch there. They have a billion dollar valuation and they're still at pre pre-concept stage, you've got early ideas or the really early revenue. And sometimes that puts off investors as well. So make sure you have a realistic valuation and when you put it on this deck and then your ask is based on your financials and what you're actually trying to achieve and what you can roughly go, go, go and achieve as well. On the financials, you've got to remember it's forecasting. So it doesn't have to be down to the penny. It's just a rough idea of what you need, how much it's going to cost to get out there. Competition for staffs get a very, very tight sometimes in some certain areas in the, and industries. Certain developers that have niche set of skills, you know, it might end up costing you $200,000 for that developer. So you could have to forecast on what those costs are gonna be when you're making the raise. And that's part of your deal and your ask, right? And then making sure you understand the terminology of convertible notes, warrants, ROIs, series A, B, C, pre-revenues, all the terminology that goes into asking and raising for capital. 
Make sure you understand that. Don't just rely on an advisor. Um, make sure you know what you're talking about because whenever you're out, you're at a networking event, you know, always be closing. You always have an opportunity to talk to an investor that may end up giving you a check and you'll meet the randomest investors in the randomest places. So if you can talk about convertible notes and warrants, uh, series A, B, C, pre C very confidently, um, it's going to be better better set for you as a CEO or a founder or, or the CFO to go and raise capital. So the deal section is important in the sense that you've got to make sure it's clear and you understand. So when you get questions and say, is it a safe note? What's a safe note? You can answer it confidently. Confidence when presenting a pitch deck is also going to be a, bit, a big attraction to many investors because it shows you know what you've done, you know what you're doing, and you know where you're going. And then you have an exit plan. You've got to have an exit plan. Even if you haven't thought about it, start thinking about it now. There's got to be an end game because at the end of the day, investors just want to know how they're going to get their money back and make some money on top of that. So get some advice, you know, or really early enough to say, okay, is it going to be a Google purchase? Is it going to be a Facebook purchase? Is it going to be a competitor that we're looking to hopefully buy us out? It's just an objective. It doesn't mean that's the end final goal. It's just an early objective that you're trying to get to. You're, any parts of this business plan and the pitch deck can change at any time. It's a blueprint that pivots all the time. So try and have some target companies that you'd like to take notice of you. Try and have some target companies that you think, okay, we could partner with, or you know, the exit plan could be become a strategic partner with something. It doesn't mean you have to sell to someone. Right? There's different types of exit plans, but you've got to have that part of your deck so it's attractive enough for people to say, look, this is what these guys are thinking to do it. And they may even be connected saying, yeah, I can get them there. I can get them in front of these people. So make sure you have this as an important section in there. And then traction, you know, any milestones, if you can show milestones of traction, traction, attraction could be as minimum as we've got meetings with XYZ companies already that you're targeting as your demographic market. That's traction. Traction could also mean you've already started generating revenue, you know? So you've got to showcase tractions and communicating this to in investors. You show, look, we're hitting our milestones. This is where we started. This is where we're at and then we're going there. Shows you have the understand ability to execute on what you're trying to achieve. So showing traction will also tie into the exit plan saying, okay, these guys could probably achieve the end goal at three to four years because they're already doing these things and so you've got to be able to showcase that on your deck and then you've got the close so the close would be you're going to summarize the problem you know what's out there what the issue is the solution which is what you have created and then your ask always ask for your ask again so you had your ask earlier on the deal that's your ask and you're going to ask again so you ask twice that should be a part of a good close and say hey are we looking to raise this much? This is where, and anything else you may have. You may, your ask could also be, you may want to get additional advisors or you want to be introduced to people in key industries. So it can doesn't have to always just be financial. Your ask can be more than that and put that as part of your close. Um, and always make sure you have your contact information in your deck. I have seen so many decks where it ends with the end. Uh, and that doesn't work. You know? So make sure you've got an email address or the phone number or the best contacts to have there, uh, your LinkedIn, whatever you like to use, but make sure there's some way investors, potential partners can reach out to you and it's on your deck. So hopefully this has been helpful, this section. Uh, I have Jerome, who, who's my colleague, who's actually the main liaison on behalf of OKR Financial uh, with Communitech. Uh, he's based out there. I'm currently actually in the UK, but Traditionally, I'm actually based in Vancouver. And that is the end of my presentation. Any questions? Thanks for that, Babak. I'm sure uh, there'll be questions flowing in as people digest those, those slides. I do see one here in the, the Q&A. Um, how can a startup that is pre-revenue go about getting some indication of validation if they have yet to land a SaaS pricing model? Can this be done well after some market track or sorry, some traction in the market? Uh, yes, it can. Um, it's really simple, right? Um, it's forecasting, right? It's all forecasting. So understanding your market and a good way of doing that is um, see what your competitors are doing and take that as like a benchmark, right? Um, for the valuation, what I would turn around is 
talk to talk to business advisor. There's loads of them out there uh, and say, look, this is what we've done so far. What do you think we're worth? This is what it's costing me. And what do you think the company's value that? And so, yeah, you can do pre-revenue. Um, it's not going to be a billion dollars. It's got to be realistic. But I've seen pre-revenue companies that they're asking for a $1.5 million investment. And they're probably valued at around five, six million dollars, which is realistic, right? So, yes, you can do it as pre-revenue. Great. We have a, a question here from Casera. Why do solar founders typically have a tougher time raising investment? Because they're too busy developing their product. Um, you find people that when they're on their own, they can only do so many things in a day, and they end up spending about eighteen hours on product, product, product and less time on raising capital, looking for grants, looking for tax credits, looking for investors. Um, so that's why it's really difficult. It's you can only do so many things by yourself as a solo entrepreneur. So it really is, if you're really good at time management and breaking your week up and scheduling, say, look, I'm gonna spend Fridays just networking and trying to raise money, you could be pretty successful doing it. But if, if you're just focusing on just the product development, trying to get it out there and hopefully someone bites as you're doing these events, uh, you can have a harder time. It's really that simple. So less less about perception from the investors and more about um, being able to spread your yourself across uh, the company. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from Paul. What is the best way that you've seen the financials presented? Uh, simple charts. You know, simple charts. This is what they are. I've seen somewhere you've got a chart where you've got profit and loss or break evens, and then you have a little bit of that where the actual spend is going to be. So there's various ways of doing it, um, but keep it simple and clear. So this is exactly what it is. Uh, if you have a billion numbers and X, Y, Zs and dots everywhere and Excel spreadsheets, you lose people. So keep it very, very simple, either a simple chart or a table to showcase exactly what you're doing. That's helpful. We did have a couple of questions that came in ahead of the session. So maybe I'll just flip over to those for a second. Um, the first one is if you're doing pre-seed, um, or a seed round, what are the key points investors are looking for at that stage? The key points uh, they're looking for is market validity. So you've actually proven that, that there is a market for this and where you're going to land. That's what key things investors are looking for is market validity. Um, so it's really that simple. Just make sure you understand where you're going to get there. And you're not the, you're not the last one to the game. The next question is, um, how does a founding team that is, you know, new in their entrepreneurial journey um, really stand out? So if they're, you know, a new grad or early on in their career, how can they um, make themselves stand out to investors um, or I guess show credibility? To show credibility, I would go to the first of all is how much money have you raised on your own? You know, if you've gone out there and got government, and I'm going I'm to harp on government grants because that's the big one that's out there. If you've got to think of the government as an investor. So when they're giving you a grant, they're actually investing in you. If you can go and showcase, you can raise money through government grants or non-dilutive. That's one way of staying an investor. Okay, these guys have the tenacity to go and actually raise capital. So that's one way of doing it. And the other one is, as a new young company, you don't want to raise, again, equity so early. Because if you raise equity now just to get to MVP stage, by the time you go to commercialization, you are not going to be owning your company. Uh, most founders, 90% of them will lose ownership if they raise money right, really right early. So when you get to the commercialization stage, it's really where you want to really start raising or MVP stage. So if you're really early, develop that product, develop that prototype, validate the market, make sure you can actually make money off this and then go, go and start knocking on doors and showcasing yourself. That's, that, those are really great points. Um, for the audience, if you haven't already engaged with your Communitech advisor or CSM, please feel free to reach out. We um, have a government grant and concierge service at Communitech, so we can help you find some of those grants. Or if you are at the stage where you're ready to start meeting investors or with like, you know, some eyes or feedback on your deck, um, we can provide that as well. We have a full investment readiness team um, at Communitech. So just a little um, plug there for some of the ways we can we can help early on. There yeah, is another question. Uh, sorry, I just want to add. Sorry, just want to add to what Christine just said. So, with your with the community tech having that service for concierge for government funding, you may find that um, sometimes it's like ninety percent of the programs are sort of a dollar to dollar match. You need some sort of a cash contribution to qualify. Don't let that scare you. That's where OKR comes in. 
we can actually provide an LOI to say we would provide the cash contribution so you can qualify. So this will allow you to go after many more programs by doing that. Yeah, 100%. Great point. Uh, a couple more questions coming in here. In your experience, what is the most common way that young, particularly student entrepreneurs fail in the early startup stages? Uh, they fail because, um, to please don't, I don't offend anyone, but you have crazy founders, which is all they care about is developing a product. And they don't really think about the full business plan of how am I going to commercialize this or how am I going to get it to market? And so a lot of young students fail because all they're trying to do is build this fancy product um, or tool and they, they lose focus. Um, so the best way for an early stage company not to fail is do your research, uh, market validation, make sure the product's really worth out there. There's no one, nothing else exists and figure out the cost, just do your rough financial forecast. Again, if it's a passion project and you're not going to make any money, don't bother doing it. Um, and a lot of the passion projects out there are restaurants. Uh, does not really relevant to this, but anytime someone opens up a bar, it's normally a passion project and they fail. Same thing in the tech, tech sector as well. If it's a passion product, so do your research. Just figure out how long is it going to take? Can you survive three years on not earning anything and this was your full-time gig, then you're great. But if you can't, figure out when will you actually start making money. So do your research and spend some time on the financials and the market research. Yeah. I think to, you know, evaluating early on what kind of business you want to grow, how big the market is, um, because some businesses, you know, are completely successful with bootstrapping to getting to a path of revenue. But and so it doesn't always make sense to raise investment. But if you are going after exactly. that investment, you need to understand what the, you know, what the return is going to be and, and how big it, how big the opportunity is. A yeah, uh, question here from Adam. Um, can you share what makes a deal appealing to an investor for success? What kind of return are they typically looking for at the seed round? There's not a magic answer for that. It really comes down to what you're trying to do. Um, when we say appealing to investor, like for example, my group, we're more opportunity focused. Does it make sense to any of us understand the industry and can we see it? Uh, and we just literally vote on deals because it just appeals. So we've got someone in our team that is in the space industry. So satellites, engineering, we've got someone that has a big background in events and marketing in the alcohol industry. We've got someone that's more gaming focused, you know, so we all have different interests. So really the deal comes down to um, what can you realistically achieve and, and how quick can you really achieve it in milestone rights? So if you can showcase that you are good at executing that's probably the biggest appeal for an investor saying these guys know what they're doing. They're actually hitting the goals. Um, and then when it comes to dollar amount, it really comes down to what you really need and is it realistic enough? Um, if you're going to ask for 90% of funding and it's all going towards marketing, it all depends what kind of investor says, okay, you know what? I can work with that. Um, but you're going to find, especially if you're early stage, it's all going to be about the technology and have you been hitting your goals and you've got the right team. Um, what are some common mistakes you see uh, founders make in their pitch decks? What are some what are some things to to avoid? First one is people make it so complicated, especially on the technical side, and people don't understand the actual tech or the solution. So you've really got to simplify it. Make sure it's everyone can understand it. So stupid proof. That's what I normally say. Just dumb it down. Whatever you're trying to do. So that's number one. So a lot of founders make a mistake with that. Second one is. Practice your pitch. Make sure you're not talking too fast. Make sure people can understand you clearly and you've hit your point. So don't just show up and wing it. Uh, there's some natural people that can do that. There's a lot of people that, especially founders, struggle when they go to pitch. And sometimes they get nervous and they really just misrepresent the company. And they have a great product, great technology. And they just do themselves bad by doing that. And then the next one is probably the last one is valuation. You know, get a realistic valuation um, for this to work. Right? If you're out for lunch, people say, okay, you haven't done your homework, right? So I probably say those are the three key things. So simple, keep it simple, stupid. Um, you know, make sure, you know, you practice your pitch. And then the third one is valuation. Yeah? So those are the two top three things I would say, common mistakes. Perfect. Um, what is the most efficient way to reach out to potential investors after you've researched possible alignment? 
Um, there's various ways of doing that, but I would, I, I would also talk to people in the network when you're networking because you're going to get a lot of angel groups that will take your money to go and pitch. So in North America, a lot of the groups out here will actually charge you to come and pitch, especially angel associations with these. And it could be anywhere from 500 bucks to 1500 bucks to I've seen $15,000. And if you don't, if you can't afford that, don't do that. And the reason I say research angel groups is you've actually got specific groups that like to precede investments. You've got ones that will only look at if you are $3 million in revenue or more, health tech, the very particular, a lot of the groups on where they want to invest. Find out who your audience is. Don't just go and don't just go and pitch everywhere and spend your money everywhere, especially if you don't have the, the liquid cash. Um, and then reach out to advisors, like consulting firms, like OKR, you can reach out to me and say, hey, look, this is what we're doing. Do you know a group that we can um, present? I can advise you. And there's many groups out there like that. And probably some advisor at Communitech as well, who are connected to angel groups and they can say, yeah, this is something that you should be presenting here because there's people there that love this sort of technology or this type of industry. So don't just, don't go and do a thousand pitches a year. It's not going to have benefit. Be very selective and do some research. And you'll find out, sometimes you'll find someone in a network who is an angel, they can get you in front of a group for free because they brought you to the table. So just get out there. If you see on LinkedIn, angel investor, reach out to them and talk to them. At Communitech, we also have um, an opportunity to get in front of some investors early for like a friendly conversation to kind of test your messaging, see how it lands um, before, you know, actually going and, and pitching to them um, when, when you're ready to run, uh, raise money. So if you're thinking about it and you want to kind of test out how some of that stuff is landing, uh, it's also a friendly space to, to meet with investors and, and just start building, building that confidence. Uh, a couple other questions here. Um, how do, how can you present a market opportunity when your tech is disrupting or expanding, um, a market. So if you feel like this is a brand brand new market or you're disrupting a market, how do you represent that? Um, you out have, of you, yeah. Again, I mentioned you have to sort of showcase if there's got to be something similar or in that space. And you're just going to showcase, you understand the industry. So you could say these companies are doing this and it doesn't work. And that's why we exist because they're disrupting the market because that's what we're doing. So you're just going to showcase who the players are in the industry. It doesn't always have to be competition. So, but you've got to have, just got to showcase industry knowledge. You know who's in the market. It could be like a Microsoft and just haven't bothered developing this because it reduces their sales, right? With what you're developing. So showcase that, you know, we are gonna, we're going to disrupt Microsoft or we're going to disrupt Google because of what we're doing. But showcase who it's going to affect, not necessarily competition, but who you're affecting with your disruption. Perfect. That was all the questions that I had that came in ahead of today's session. Are there any final questions from participants? Or I guess while we're waiting to see if there's any final questions, um, any final thoughts from you, Babak, on the, on the topic? Uh, my final thoughts would be, you know, take your time. You know, think, of the, think of the pitch deck as a mini blueprint uh, for you to grow your business. And as you pivot, create a new pitch deck. And, you know, you're not going to just use one pitch deck for wherever you present. Uh, you might have three or four. So create three or four projects, depending on who your audience is, um, and then tweak them and work on them and always modify them. You always better it. And, and you know, another way of learning curve is record yourself pitching and you'll see your mistakes. Are you talking too fast? Are you talking too slow? Uh, did you complicate this? Uh, and the best way to do it is, you know, present with people that you know really well and they'll give you honest feedback uh, and practice. Um, because if you can do it very confidently and they believe and investors believe in what you're saying and what you're trying to do, you will raise money. Great. Those are, those are some great suggestions. Thank you so much um, for presenting here today. It doesn't look like we have any other questions coming in from the audience. I will invite um, everyone to stay at their tables and, and network. And I believe, Bavik, you're here until um, 11. And so maybe you're able yeah. to also jump around tables um, if there's any, any last you know, questions that people are too afraid to ask in front of the whole group. So um, we welcome you to do that. Uh, actually, I did see one last uh, question. Does OKR offer pitch deck preparation service no uh i just do this workshop to sort of educate people in the industry so i don't offer it um, 
but if you need some advice, you can reach out. Um, I'd be happy to help you out. Wonderful. So with that, I will uh, close things out for today. So once again, thank you for joining today's session. Thank you, Bavik, for sharing your, your knowledge and information with our, our audience. And I look forward to seeing everyone next time. Take care. Thank you.